Good morning. Welcome to Polk Street United Methodist Church. I'm Leslie Broadbent, the senior pastor of Polk Street. We want to welcome you to worship on this 21st anniversary of the events on 9-11. We likely all remember where we were that day 21 years ago. And we, uh, we, we remember the shock and the horror. We remember the rage that burned inside many of us. But I pray that we will all recall God's presence with us as well. For we know that God was present with us on that day 21 years ago. And we also know that God is present with us on this day. And so we want to welcome you to worship with us. Again, especially this morning, we want to welcome our first-time guests. We recognize here at Polk Street and almost every worship service that we have, we have first-time guests in our midst. And so if you are here in person for the very first time, if you are joining with us online or in our television broadcast for the very first time, we want to welcome you warmly. We want you to know that you found a place where you can be yourselves. You found a place where you can grow in your faith. You found a place where you can uh, develop lifelong, even generational Christian friends. We found that to be such a place. We want to thank you so much for being our guest uh, this morning. Uh, a couple of things that we want you to know. Uh, one of those things is that we have started our, officially started our discernment process here at Polk Street. Uh, our denomination is in the midst of some changes and some conflict. And so we are in the beginning stages of uh, discerning God's will for our church. Uh, many of you who are here in person were already in some groups this morning. We watched a video already once this morning, uh, and we we heard uh, we heard from a presenter today, and we're going to be hearing of different from different presenters over the next three weeks, and they're going to be making the cases for either remaining in the United Methodist Church or disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. Uh, if you were not able to be in one of those groups today, those videos will be available each week on our website at psumc.com. You can go to our uh, transitional process, uh, or excuse me, discernment process uh, portion of our website, and you can watch those videos. There will also be discussion questions there along with the video, the exact same discussion questions that we used uh, today during our process. Once again, if you are if you're planning on being part of the voting process, whenever that time might come, likely in February or March of next year, if you're intending to be part of that voting process, we would strongly encourage you to watch this series of videos. We also want you to know, uh, we want the congregation to know that our church council, our elected leaders of this church, we are praying every single day for you, the congregation. Every day at noon, the church council is praying for you. And then on Fridays, the church council is also fasting for you. We are in prayer and fasting for you. The church council will be doing that for the next four weeks. And so know that our prayers are with you and for you. And the other thing I want you to know is that we are taking some steps here at Polk Street because we know that there have been rising, uh, there's a rising crime rate, not only here in Amarillo, but around our country. We know that churches have been targeted at times. We know large gatherings of people have been targeted as well. We're beginning to take more steps for security. We want you to know that this door on uh, the northeast corner of our sanctuary, it will be locked on Sunday mornings and it will be locked throughout all of the rest of the week. So you, you need to know that if you need to use that door uh, on Sunday mornings, there's a short portion of time that it will be unlocked. The rest of the time it will be, it will be locked. So we are encouraging you, you to use the west doors of our church or the northwest door of our church. We're just trying to increase the security just a bit. We've had, we've had some instances very recently that we're just trying to increase our security presence here. We want to keep you safe. As the, as the shepherd of, of this flock, it's one of my, that's one of my primary responsibilities is to keep the flock safe. And so we are taking steps to do so. Well, if you are here in person, if you would please stand with me. I want to remind you why we are here. No doubt, no doubt we remember that day 21 years ago, but more so on this day, we are called to remember and to celebrate that day almost 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ was resurrected. For you see, that's what it is all about. He is alive. Amen? Amen. 
Let's turn in our hymnals, if you would, to number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. Please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and the blessing of, our, of your unconditional love. Lord, today we say a special blessing over those affected by the events of 9-11. Dear Lord, we ask that you wrap your arms around them and give them comfort and understanding. Father, you are the same today as you were yesterday and as you are tomorrow. Since the beginning of mankind, you sought to have a relationship with your creation, to instruct us in the way we ought to go. As we begin this process of discernment, we again seek your guidance. We pray that the Holy Spirit will give us a peace beyond understanding. Father, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, wills to obey, and hearts to love. Grant us patience and help us to put our trust in you so we might be able to filter out the noises of the world and focus on your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also join me in the affirmation of faith as printed in the bulletin. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, 
nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. everybody. I am so glad all of you are here today with us this morning. Y'all are looking sharp once again. Yeah. So, okay. So I have here with me a gift, right? This looks like this could be a pretty cool gift inside here. You never know what's inside. I don't know. But okay. So, um, Briar, I have a question for you. Okay. So, um, if I give you this gift, will you give me $5 for it? You can have this if you give me $5. Would you do that? Maybe she's thinking about it. She's thinking about it. Well, okay, let me ask you this. If I ask you to give me $5 for this, it's no longer a gift, is it? No, yeah. A gift is something that we give somebody without expecting anything in return. So picture you at your, at your birthday party, okay? People come to your birthday party, they bring you gifts, they don't expect anything in return. They don't expect you to pay them for, any, for that, right? No, they might ask for a piece of cake, but they don't really expect for you to give them anything in return. So they come to your birthday party, they give you a gift because they love you, they care about you. And, but you know, there is like the ultimate gift, okay? God gave each and every one of us an ultimate gift of eternal life. It tells us in the book of John, chapter 3, and um, verse 16, that it tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, and that whosoever is any of us, okay, believes in him, believes in Jesus, that they will have eternal life. Yes, so they will not perish, but they will have eternal life is what that verse tells us. So that gift from God is way better than any gift that we could ever imagine here. And that gift is free. He doesn't tell us, hey, Linda, you know what? Give me $5 and I'll let you have eternal life. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't even ask for a piece of cake. No, he gives us that gift of eternal life anytime that we ask Jesus to come into our hearts. So we say, Jesus, I want you to be our forever friend. I want you to live in my heart forever and ever and ever. And God gives us the gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus. So, so remember that God gives us way better gifts than anything that could fit inside here, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Whenever we ask you to live in our hearts forever and ever, that you give us that gift of eternal life. Help us to have a great week this week. Thank you so much for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm Kevin Deckard, one of the associate pastors here at Polk Street. And our worship will continue with a time of corporate prayer. As we join in prayer, there's so many things that we're thankful for, including those who have been visiting our homebound members, and also our San Jacinto school prayer team. They go on the school days uh, physically to the campus and pray over our partner school, San Jacinto Elementary. Likewise, we have uh, other concerns and joys listed on the bottom of page three of your bulletin, and I invite you to add to your list our Christian sympathy to Carl Rice, upon the death of his nephew, Roger Curry, who died this past Thursday in Colorado Springs. As we begin our prayer time today, you are invited to come and pray with us by kneeling at the altar rail. Our prayer time will also have a time of silent prayer to give you some time to listen to the Lord speak to you. 
Sometimes we're too busy speaking to God and we don't take time to hear what God says to us. Also, you'll have an opportunity to lift up those people on your heart that need God's healing, love, and grace. Our prayer time will conclude after you name those names with the response in your bulletin and then the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Most merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to both hear your voice and to talk to you, sharing the very depths of our hearts. We're grateful to be able to approach you at any time and for any reason through the sacrificial gift of your Son, Jesus, on the cross. We pray this morning for all serving in the military throughout the world. We pray for missionaries who fearlessly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Protect them and open hearts to receive the good news that Jesus is both Lord and Savior of the world. We also pray for the persecuted church. We ask that your hand of protection be upon those who face injury, separation from families and death, for standing firm in their Christian faith. Oh God, 21 years later, we remember those who died in senseless acts of terror on 9-11. We remember those heroes and first responders that day. We remember your steadfast love in the midst of every trial. We pray for peace in this world and as far as it depends on us to love everyone as we seek to imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for healing for Elsie Schultz and Sue Hamilton who have recently been hospitalized. We also pray for your comfort, for the Nita Bear family, for Bernice Simpson on the death of her brother, for J.P. Davis on the death of his father, and for Carl Rice on the death of his nephew. We also pray for our partners in the gospel here in Amarillo, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Trinity Baptist Church, St. Lawrence Cathedral, and Northridge Church of Christ. We pray for three of our schools in Amarillo and for, ask for protection for students and staff at these schools. Avondale Elementary, Bonham Middle School, and Caprock High School. Now, Lord, we hear the names from this congregation of those who need your healing and matchless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now we join together as one voice saying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This Tuesday night, we're going to continue to reach out with the love and grace of Jesus Christ to the students, parents, and staff at St. Jacinto Elementary School at their tailgate party at 6 o'clock p.m. on their campus. And Polk Street will be providing soft drinks, bottled water, and also ice cream, as well as uh, people from this church to reach out and love and, and get to meet those people we minister with each and every day of the week. So if you haven't responded to me and you plan on being there, let me know and I'll make sure you have a nice blue Polk Street United Methodist t-shirt to wear at that event. There are three ways that you can give here at the church. Of course, here in person, but you can go online to psumc.com to make your gift or you may mail your gift into the church office. Ushers, would you come forward to receive our tithes and offerings? And as they do so, let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day that you've made, and thank you, God, for generous hearts in this church that you've raised up. Lord, we pray a blessing on these gifts. We want them to further the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community, in this state, in the United States, and on into the world. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to be ambassadors for Christ wherever we may be. In Jesus' name, amen.
please remain standing. Our hymn this morning is 451 in your hymnal, Be Thou My Vision. If you would please remain standing if you are able for the reading of our word, the, the word of God this morning. It comes out of the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. No doubt the first verse at the very least will, be, will sound very, very familiar to you. Zach is here to read our scripture for us this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon this, your word, and make it be for us the word of life, that we might be people of life. Now, O God, hide me behind your cross, that your message of Love and grace might shine through for the redemption of the world through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love what I do for a living. I absolutely love what I do. It is more, no doubt, it is more than a, than a job to me. It is more than a vocation for me. It is a divine calling upon, upon my life. God called me out of the blue. Uh, I, I, would, I had never thought about being a pastor, but God, it was a divine calling upon my life. And so I know, I know that I was born for this very purpose. I know that I was born for this very purpose. And I love what I do. I love being your pastor. I love being a pastor. But there's one part of my job that I do not enjoy at all. There's, one, there's more than one, but one in particular... <laughs> One, depending on the week, and one in particular, it certainly stands out. And the part of my job that I, I don't enjoy at all is leading a funeral for someone who did not profess the Christian faith. It's difficult. 
In fact, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. I, I remember one, one um, instance in particular. I, I, I was called by a funeral home director, and I didn't know this funeral home director, and he called me up, and he, he buttered me up when he first got on the phone, and he said, oh, Pastor Leslie, I've, I've heard so much about you. I don't think he had ever heard of me, but he said, I, I've heard so much about you. I've heard so many great things about your church. He likely had not even heard about our church either. He was needing someone to do this funeral. Uh, and I, I will never turn down uh, an opportunity to be a pastor and to walk along with a family through a difficult time. And, and he didn't tell me anything about the family. He just gave me their phone number. And so I went over and we never know. We never know what we're going to step into in those situations. And so uh, we, we went, um, I went over to the house and what I found was a family that was in absolute chaos. The kids weren't getting along. They were bickering and fighting. Uh, the the widow, the, the the wife of the gentleman who had passed away, she was she was beside herself. She was arguing with the children as well. The kids were already beginning to divide up what the dad had left to the mom and what the dad had had maybe left to them. And it was it was a it was a family in chaos and conflict. And so what happens most of the time, whenever, almost all the time, whenever uh, a pastor goes to a family and uh, the, the family will sit around and tell the good stories and recount wonderful times together and uh, they will tell great stories about mom or dad or they'll tell great stories about grandma and their favorite memories. But in this, in this case, they didn't tell any, they didn't tell any good memories. I mean, I kept listening for the good memories, and they shared none. This man who had died was a raging alcoholic. He was mean to his family. He was abusive to his family. He cheated everyone in every business deal. He was not a good man at all, and his family had nothing good to say about him. So then the day of the funeral came. And I stood there with shaking knees just a little bit. And I decided right then, I hope that no one would ever have to lie at my funeral. (laughs) I I don't know that I lied that day. I may have, I may have stretched the truth just a little bit when I, when I eulogized this man. I tried to say as many good things as I could about him, but I tried also to, to share the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today we are examining this myth, this urban legend, this spiritual myth that that has made its inroads into really our culture that that all good people go to a better place when they die. Now, 72% of Americans believe in heaven. 58% of Americans believe in hell. To be honest, those numbers were quite shocking to me. I, I really was surprised that that larger percentage of Americans believe in hell. 58%. Again, this is not just religious folks. These are all, this is all Americans. 58% of all Americans believe, believe in hell. However, only 3% of Americans believe that they are the, they are the ones who actually go to hell. <laughs> it's not shocking at all. We believe that maybe other people might go, but not us, certainly not, not us. And in the, and in the United Methodist Church, we don't talk about these things much. In fact, in, in my first year, just over a year, I don't, I've probably not even mentioned hell. And in the United Methodist Church, we don't talk about such things because, because, and we're very proud of this, and this is one of the reasons I'm a Methodist, we lead with grace. We believe, we believe that, well, we don't believe that people should have, should literally have the hell scared out of them in order to get to heaven. We believe that first, we need to offer grace and love and a, and a message of, of God's forgiveness. We first lead with grace. I think that's one of the strengths of the Methodist movement is that we lead with grace, but the problem oftentimes in leading with grace is we never get to the, we never get to the other part. And so it has made inroads into our churches and into our culture that, that everybody, everybody goes, everybody goes to a better place. And when we come across people who are not 
professing Christians and they die, well, we begin to have, we begin to have different standards for them, don't we? Instead of starting with a relationship with Christ, we lower the standards. We look for any nod that that person may have given to God over their lives. Just a quick nod. Oh, you know, he, belie- he sure believed in God. It may have been one moment in time. It may have been one comment to a family member at some time that that, that person believed in God. As long as, they, as long as they give a nod to God, we will, well, maybe, maybe once. Again, maybe once they said they believed in God, there was no evidence or fruit of that belief from God. But again, maybe just, maybe just one time in their life, they, they gave a little nod to God. Well, that's enough for many of us. And we want to we say, you know, God, God, God is a God of grace and no doubt He is. Well, if they haven't made that quick nod to God, we lower the standard just a little bit more. We, then our standard is just basic morality. Were they nice to their family? Did, did, they, did they kick the dog or not? Were, were, they, were they kind of a moral person? And if so, then we will celebrate them. Oh, boy, I tell you, Joe, he was, he was, a, he was a good old guy. You know, Grandma, we, we, it's not even necessarily basic moral and ethics, or maybe it's just, a, maybe it's just a, 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 something good from their life. You know, Grandma, she was a great cook. It's the best we can come up. She was a great cook. We know that they're in heaven. She's just cooking up a feast for the saints in heaven. And if we can't find any of those in a person's life, a quick nod to God or some sort of good attribute from their life, we'll say, you know, he sure had a good heart. He sure had a good heart. You know, he he fell into a bad crowd. He made some bad bad, bad decisions. Certainly, he was a raging alcoholic. No doubt, he was mean to his family. No doubt, he cheated everybody all the time. But you know what? He had a good heart. I, I I call it the all dogs go to heaven theology. All dogs go to heaven. And I have, a, I have a, one of my best friends said this one day. He said, you know, some people say that all dogs go to Make heaven. Quick but those people God, I never met, the they've never met the bird bit. dogs that I've had in my life. I can promise you, those dogs aren't there. I, I wonder. I wonder if we're more prone to say that, that, that not all dogs go to heaven more than we are to say that not all people go to heaven. You know, this, this, this myth that everyone goes to a better place, it says everyone goes to a better place. 9-11 terrorists, Christians and non-Christians, religious people and non-religious people, good people and bad people, moral people, immoral people, amoral people, they all, they all go to a better place. So today, thankfully, this is the conclusion of this sermon series. <laughs> I saved the easiest for the last. No, I didn't. Um, we've, we've been examining a number of different myths that we have in the church. Urban legends that we like to share, like God, God wants us to be happy. And we saw that that's, that's just simply a myth in the life of the church. We saw that everything happens for a reason. Reason is also a, another spiritual urban legend. Good homes guarantee good children. We found that that's not, that's not the truth always. That God won't give you more than you can handle. We saw that's not the truth. Instead, God won't give us more than what God can handle. Last week, Pastor Kevin, we examined that urban legend that Christians are never to judge, but instead we saw that that there are times that we are called to judge and hold one another accountable. And we have a different standard for believers than non-believers in the life of the church. We must hold one another, one another accountable. And today we're examining this urban legend, this spiritual myth, that when someone dies, they always go to a better place. Our scripture this morning is one that you likely, no doubt, you have, you have heard before, and very likely you even learned as a small child. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What we don't examine, however, is this passage of Scripture in its context. Nicodemus was a Jewish ruler, part of the Jew, uh, part of the um, really part of the a political party in Judaism, and he and he came he came to Jesus 
And he told Jesus, now we understand that you are from God. We know that you are from God. Nicodemus, in some sense, was affirming some sort of faith in Jesus, some sort of intellectual uh, assertion that Jesus had come from God. He knew who Jesus was. And Jesus told him in response to that, he said, unless a person is born again, that person won't see the kingdom of God. That person won't see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus believed in God. He believed that Jesus was from God, maybe even God himself, but born again? Born again? Nicodemus said, how can a person be born again? How how can a person enter into their mother's womb again and be born again? And Jesus said, flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus, in response to to, to, to Nicodemus' questions about, about what it means to be a follower of Jesus or to be a follower of God tells him exactly how you become a follower of God. You believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, a lot has been made of that belief, that word belief. And for many of us, we take that word believe to just simply be a mental assent to the facts of the story. We say that to believe means to believe that Jesus was indeed God's son, that he actually did come, God did come to earth and he became one of us and he died on the cross and he was resurrected for us. I will tell you, I suggest that Nicodemus at this point in his life, he would affirm the exact same things. He believed that Jesus was from God. The book of James says, you believe that God is good, Great. Even the demons believe that God is good and they shudder. This isn't a just a mental assent to the historical facts, but it is about trust. Nicodemus knew the facts, but he had not been born again. He had not put his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus. If you want to argue with What I'm saying today, argue with Jesus, try not to argue with me. (laughs) I'm going to stay out of it. I find, I find that Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We want, no doubt, we want to affirm, we want to affirm and accept everyone as we should. Love them exactly where they are. but I want you to hear something. You think you're a good person, and I know many of you, and you are. You think your goodness is good enough to save you. You are flat out wrong. You're flat out wrong. There is such a chasm between us and God. If God is over here as holy and perfect and righteous, and we are all the way over here in some sort of fallen state. Has has anyone ever done anything wrong? I I, I was hoping that there were going to be hands. Anybody ever done anything? Oh, yeah. There were times in my life that I would even call myself evil. But then there are times in my life I'm really good. You ask my mama, she'll tell you I'm a really good boy. You know, I can try so hard and I can be so good and I can be so generous with my life and my, and my goodness and my righteousness, it may, it may get me to hear. God is all the way over there. The chasm between where we are and where God is is far too much for us to bridge that chasm by ourselves. Our goodness cannot get us there. A belief in God cannot get us there. A basic morality cannot get us there. A good heart cannot get us there. It takes God coming to us in Jesus Christ, bridging that gap. And the only way that we can experience the very good 
forgiveness of God is to accept that offer of forgiveness. It's the only way. We can't be good enough no matter how hard we try. Now, pastor, isn't this being very exclusive? Well, I think Jesus was fairly exclusive. In chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, he talks about a narrow gate. And he talks about a, he talks about a narrow road and a wide road. That wide road leads to destruction, but that, that narrow road leads to that narrow gate of salvation. So I hope that God forgives everyone. Absolutely, I do. But here again, Jesus' words. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. What great news! Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We cannot save ourselves. No matter how good we are, no matter how good of a heart we are, have no matter how moral we are, we cannot save ourselves. Salvation comes by giving our lives to Jesus Christ. Salvation comes by responding to His gift, His offer of salvation with faith and hope and trust, laying our lives down at the foot of the cross. That's how salvation comes. I don't know what happens to other people. I'll leave that up to God. But I know this. I believe in the words of Jesus. And I believe, I believe that we are called to put our faith and our hope and our trust in Him and Him alone. So if you are here today and you're relying upon that quick nod that you gave to God many years ago, if you're here today and you're relying upon your own moral standing, if you are here today relying upon the goodness of your heart, I would challenge you instead, put your faith and your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. He wants, you, he wants to bring you into His family. Would you bow with me? Oh, no doubt, oh God, there are times in our lives where we have relied, we've relied upon our own goodness. We have relied upon our attendance at church. We've relied upon the dollar sign of the check that we have given to others. We have relied upon the goodness of our hearts. God, the chasm between us and you is so wide. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot be good enough. We cannot be generous enough. We cannot have a good enough heart to save ourselves. It takes you coming to us, offering us forgiveness for sins. It took you coming and taking our place upon the cross. takes us accepting that offer of salvation. So right where we are, O oh Lord, we pray this prayer. Come, Jesus, and be our Lord and be our Savior. We put our hope and our trust and our faith in You, not on our goodness, not in anything in this world, but we put our faith and our hope and our trust in You alone. We believe in You. Come and save us, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you are here in person, if you are able, if you would please stand. Turn in your hymnals to number 141, Children of the Heavenly Father. No doubt today there may be some who are here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you had a quick nod to God at one point in your life. Maybe you're a good and moral person. Maybe you have a good heart. But you've never given your heart. You've never given your lives. You've never put your faith and your trust and your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to do so today. I would encourage you to go to the Lord. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to be your Savior and your Lord. If you would like to come forward and pray at the altar, I know one of our clergy would be we would be so humbled to pray with you or to pray for you. If you've never been a member of a church and you're interested in church membership here at Polk Street, I would encourage you to visit with us today as well. Number 141, Children of the Heavenly Father. Now go as those who are trusting in the goodness of God, not upon your own goodness, not upon the goodness of your heart, not upon a quick nod to God years ago, but you are trusting in the goodness of God through Jesus Christ. Go as God's children. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.